In the sprawling corridors of the Galactic Council's headquarters, Earth's delegation was always seen but seldom noted. Deemed technologically primitive, Earth was a silent, almost invisible member of the Interstellar Assembly. That perception shattered during the Council's emergency summit. As fleets from across the galaxy stood on the brink of annihilation by a rogue civilization, Earth revealed its hidden truth. From the shadows of underestimated obscurity, a fleet of warships, cloaked and dormant on the dark side of the moon, emerged. This moment marked a new era, one where Earth would no longer watch from the sidelines. The Galactic Council's chamber buzzed with a polyglot din, a chaotic symphony played by the universe's disparate species. At the center of this discord stood Thomas Reed, Earth's delegate, his demeanor an island of calm in a sea of frenetic tension. Delegates, please! His voice cut through the clamor, a blade forged in Earth's newfound steeliness. The chamber gradually settled into a grudging silence, eyes from a thousand worlds fixed upon him. We've received troubling intel, Reed continued, his holographic display pulsing with red at the fringes of known space. The Ryla Confederacy has breached the neutral zone. This is a calculated provocation, a test of our resolve. A murmur swept through the assembly as ripples disturbed still water. From a dark corner of the chamber, Ambassador Lyra of the Zentari hissed, and what does Earth propose? Another round of sanctions that the Rylock laugh off? Reed's eyes flickered with an uncharacteristic gleam. Not sanctions, Ambassador. A more decisive response. Meanwhile, light years away on Earth's lunar base, the ships, bristling with stealth technology and armaments, were unseen sentinels of Earth's secret resolve. Her comm link chirped. Commander, Council's greenlit operational readiness. You're to prepare for possible deployment, said General Hargreave, his image flickering with static over the vast distance. Understood, sir, Knox replied, her voice a mask of composure over the adrenaline surge. Crews are briefed, and the fleet is at full readiness. We can move out within the hour. Back in the Council chamber, Reed faced a barrage of questions. Earth has remained silent on military expansions. What game are you playing at, Reed? Demanded a third delegate, his tone laden with suspicion. No games, Reed snapped, the image of the fleet appearing behind him, a spectral phantom turned palpable threat. Merely a precaution, ensuring the peace we so cherish isn't trampled by the likes of the Ryla. The revelation hit the assembly like a supernova. Whispers crescendoed into uproar. Earth, the quiet mediators, had been amassing a hidden armada. Silence, Reed's command echoed, reinforced by the cold, hard promise of the fleet behind him. We have the means and the will to defend not just ourselves, but all civilizations threatened by tyranny. Commander Sarah Knox stood on the observation deck of the USS Vindicator, her gaze fixed on the holographic star map sprawling before her. Each flicker of light represented a vessel of Earth's clandestine fleet, now dispersing in a calculated formation towards the troubled borders of the Galactic Council's space. Initiate Phase 2, Knox commanded, her voice the calm in the storm of activity around her. The crew members responded with practiced efficiency, their movements precise a dance choreographed by countless drills. In the Galactic Council's chamber, the fallout from Earth's revelation continued to ripple through the delegations. Thomas Reed, now the eye of this political storm, navigated the corridors of power with a new gravity. You've rattled some cages, Reed, murmured Ambassador Lyra, falling into step beside him. Her tone, once condescending, now carried a hint of respect, or is it fear? That's the point, Lyra. Earth has been underestimated. Sidelined in these talks for too long, Reed replied without stopping. His stride was firm, purposeful. Underestimated indeed, Lyra conceded, her eyes narrowing. But what's your end game? Peace or power? Stability, Reed clarified sharply. We act not out of desire for dominance, but necessity. Our fleet is peacekeeping, not conquest. Back on the USS Vindicator, Knox received a transmission. The screen flickered, and General Hargreaves' face appeared, lines of concern etched into his forehead. Commander, intel suggests the Rylok are mobilizing. 
They didn't expect us to intervene so openly, he reported. Then we've got them off balance. We'll keep pressure high, Knox replied, her gaze not wavering from the tactical displays. And the council? Hargreave asked, his voice tinged with the weight of the unseen chess pieces moving across the galactic board. They're in disarray, but watching. Our next moves will set the tone for future relations. Caution, Sarah, he advised, the transmission crackling with the tension of the unfolding scenario. Knox nodded once, decisively, understood. We'll proceed as planned. Knox out. On Earth, in a secure government facility, analysts pored over incoming data. The room was a hive of whispered conversations and soft keyboard clatters, the air thick with anticipation and concern. One screen in particular held everyone's attention, live feed from a drone positioned at the edge of Ryloch space. The Ryloch fleet, a swarm of dark vessels, began to move a menacing drift towards the neutral zone. Reed received the update during a closed session with the Council's core representatives, his communicator vibrating against his chest. He read the message, his face betraying no emotion. Delegates, the Ryloch advance as we speak. Earth's fleet stands ready to protect not just our interests, but all those of the Council, he declared, his voice resonating with a newfound authority. The chamber was silent, the other delegates exchanging glances. Earth had indeed changed the game. No longer were they mere participants. They were now enforcers, guardians. On the fringe of the Sigma-7 Quadrant, a strategic choke point in galactic space, the USS Vindicator stood sentinel. The bridge was a low hum of controlled tension as reports flowed in from scout ships hidden in the shadows of nearby asteroids. Commander Knox reviewed the latest tactical overlay, her eyes narrowing. Looks like the Ryluk are making a push for the Beleri Gate. We can't let them secure it. Lieutenant Graves, her second in command, nodded in agreement. We'll need to move fast, cut them off before they consolidate. Prepare the fleet. We make our stand here, Knox ordered, her voice carrying the weight of command with ease. Meanwhile, back on the Galactic Council space station, Reed faced a barrage of inquiries. In a stuffy conference room, filled with the mixed sense of various alien flora worn by the delegates, he defended Earth's aggressive positioning. Your actions could bring us to the brink of war, exclaimed a feathered Zaloran delegate, his plumage bristling with agitation. On the contrary, Reed countered sharply, our actions are preventing the Ryluk from sparking a war they've been itching to start. We are enforcing the peace, not disrupting it. The room buzzed with whispered translations and murmured objections. In the cold void of Sigma-7, the human fleet maneuvered into a defensive formation. The starships, sleek and resilient, were a testament to Earth's hidden technological advancements. As the Ryluk fleet appeared on the horizon, a ripple of tension passed through the human crew. Fire on my command. Knox's voice was calm but firm, cutting through the potential panic. Hold, hold now. Laser beams lanced through space, striking the advancing Ryluk ships with precise fury. Explosions blossomed in the void, silent but vibrant against the backdrop of stars. Amidst the chaos, a small team of human engineers led by Dr. Emily Santos worked on deploying a series of interstellar buoys. These devices, capable of creating a temporary wormhole blockade, would prevent any reinforcements from joining the Ryluk offensive. Just a few more seconds, Santos muttered, her hands flying over the control panel. The final buoy activated, humming with energy as it came online. Back on the council station, Reed received an update. His face, usually an unreadable mask, allowed a rare smile to break through. The Ryluk have been contained. The blockade is up. The news spread quickly among the council delegates, their reactions a mix of relief and renewed respect for Earth's strategic capabilities. Perhaps, Mr. Reed, we underestimated the resourcefulness of your people, a grudgingly admiring Zalorin delegate conceded. We prefer to keep our capabilities understated. Reed replied, the corner of his mouth twitching slightly. It's more impactful that way. As the battle wound down, the aftermath was a sight of wrecked Ryloch vessels drifting aimlessly. Knox stood on the bridge of the Vindicator, watching as salvage crews prepared to clear the debris. 
We hold the line, she reiterated to her crew, who nodded, their faces set with determination. Inside the conference hall of the Galactic Council, the atmosphere had shifted dramatically. The usual murmur of diplomatic pleasantries was replaced by a charged silence as Earth's representatives entered. At the forefront, Reed strode confidently towards the podium, his steps resonating under the high vaulted ceilings. Esteemed members of the council, Reed began, his voice echoing, recent events at Sigma-7 have not only thwarted a potential disaster, but have also opened a dialogue for peace that we must now courageously engage in. Across the room, the Rylock delegation shifted uncomfortably, their scaly skins glinting under the artificial lights. They had been the aggressors, but now they were on the defensive, cornered by a human strategy they hadn't anticipated. The time for hiding in shadows is over, Reed continued, locking eyes with each of the alien ambassadors. We propose a new treaty, one that not only ensures peace, but strengthens our collective security. In a quieter part of the station, Commander Knox met privately with leaders of the other fleets. Her reputation had grown. The commander who had held the line was now a diplomat in her own right. Your tactics saved us all, Knox, murmured a grizzled Tarkin general, his voice gruff with respect. Knox nodded, acknowledging the compliment with a slight smile. We fight better together. Let's make sure we're never caught off guard again. Back in the hall, debates raged. Reed faced criticism and skepticism, but he parried each with the finesse of a seasoned diplomat. We are not the young species you once knew. We've learned, adapted, and now we offer a hand in partnership. A young Ryluk delegate, S.C.R.N., approached the podium during a recess. His tone was less confrontational, more curious. You risked much with your hidden fleet. Why reveal it now? Reed looked at him a mix of sternness and candor in his eyes. Because true strength comes from making the hard choices for peace, not war. As the council reconvened, a vote was proposed. One by one, the delegates cast their votes. The result was a landslide. The new treaty was ratified, establishing Earth as a central figure in galactic affairs. Cheers erupted from the human section, a sound of victory and relief. The newly signed treaty, brought an uneasy peace to the Galactic Council, and with it, a surge of expectations on Earth's leaders. In the Grand Hall of the newly established Interstellar Mediation Bureau on Earth, Ambassador Reed stood before a diverse assembly of species from across the galaxy. His next speech would set the tone for Earth's role in this new era. Ladies and gentlemen, creatures of all kinds, Reed began, his voice steady and clear. Today marks not the end, but the beginning of our shared responsibility. We have pledged to uphold peace, and to do so, we must understand and respect our differences. Outside, the Earth's cityscape glittered under the night sky, a symbol of human advancement and resilience. Within these walls, however, the real work was being hammered out complex negotiations, cultural exchanges, and the continuous push for mutual respect. In a quiet corner, Commander Knox briefed her team her tone serious but hopeful. Every ship in our fleet is now a beacon of this treaty. We are not just enforcers, but protectors of this fragile peace. Meanwhile, SRN, the young Rylock delegate, navigated through his first mediation session. His mentor, an aged diplomat, whispered advice that reflected centuries of interstellar politics. Use their trust in you, SRN. It's a currency more valuable than any mineral we mine. Back in the assembly, a heated debate ignited over mining rights in a sector both rich in resources and riddled with ancient territorial claims. Reed listened intently, then raised his hand for silence. Let us not be blinded by the greed of resources when our most scarce resource is trust. We must tread carefully. A grizzled Tarkin general, once skeptical of peace, now stepped forward his voice rough but genuine. I've seen too many wars. It's time I see some peace. Earth's approach has merit. Let's give their ideas a chance. As the meeting adjourned, Reed and Knox shared a brief moment of respite. Feels like steering a ship through a meteor shower, Knox commented, her expression a mix of amusement and fatigue. Reed chuckled. Just another day's work.
but look around today, we steered well. In the subsequent days, Earth's cities became hubs of cultural fusion and galactic diplomacy. Markets filled with alien spices and textiles, public forums became stages for passionate debates about cosmic philosophies, and Earth's educational institutes opened doors to alien scholars. Knox, overseeing the training of the next generation of fleet officers, emphasized adaptability. The universe is vast, and so are the lessons it holds, she told her eager cadets. 